Coming up, extraordinary Cherokees who made history. From the so-called Indian outlaw Ned Christie, to the little-known winner of the Great Bunyan Derby of 1928, Andy Payne. Plus, Mary Golda Ross, a rocket scientist and woman ahead of her time, and Dr. Isabel Cobb, the first female physician in Indian Territory. And we'll take a look back at the storied military career of Admiral Joseph Jocko Clark, the Patton of the Pacific. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning. Growing. Succeeding. And steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. Welcome to the Cherokee Nation and OCO TV. This is how we share our culture, our heritage, our history, and our language with you. What do? OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. I'm your host, Jennifer Lauren, at the Cherokee Heritage Center in Park Hill, Oklahoma. Today, we're going back in time to meet Cherokee Nation citizens who made history. Let's go back now to 1880, when northeastern Oklahoma was Indian territory. The railroads were moving in, and so too were a lot of outlaws. Ned Christie is known as an Indian outlaw, but many people here in the Cherokee Nation see him as a patriot. Well, a lot of people, when they think of Ned Christie, they think of him as an outlaw. A lot of the literature that you read, a lot of the exhibits that you see portray Ned as an outlaw who killed a deputy U.S. Marshal. To the Cherokees, though, he is a patriot. In the hills of Jolly, there lived a man called Christie. He was well respected amongst the Cherokee people. Be primarily because he spoke and wanted Cherokee sovereignty. He did not want uh, encroachment. He did not want any type of uh, dealings with the white people coming inside and basically taking what we had. Ned had grown up in uh, Adair County. Uh, his dad had fought in the Civil War, uh, Watt, Watt Christie. And Watt Christie was a known blacksmith. And so Ned growing up uh, would teach her skills to her children. Uh, he learned how to be a blacksmith too. From what I understand is that the guns that he was given from the Civil War that his dad had fought with uh, were powder guns. Uh, Ned had converted them down to uh, where it's percussion, where he didn't have to use the powder, and it made him quicker and faster to reload. And he was a young man when he was doing this. I think Ned had this feeling toward the United States and toward people who were non-Cherokee, particularly white people, that they had no right in his nation, and especially if they were going to influence it in some way. It really all begins in 1887. The Cherokee Female Seminary had burned on Easter Sunday, and there had been a council meeting that had been called here in Tahlequah. And they're discussing funds and what to do with the rebuilding of the school. He's up around the north part of Tahlequah. Uh, he's going to ride back the next day. Uh, he wants to go and get something to drink before he goes home. So he ventured to a part of town that had a, a, a speakeasy type place. Goes to visit some people up north, and there's a, man, a woman up there who sells him some whiskey. He goes, drinks that, he ends up passing out. He woke up the next morning, ventured into town where he heard he was accused of killing a marshal by the name of Dan Maples. Initially there were about five people who had been accused of being in the vicinity where Dan Maples had been shot and killed. Ned was the only one that they were never able to apprehend, therefore he became the main uh, suspect. The people there were telling Ned, they're going to be coming here looking for you. Uh, you need to take off and run. And he's, he was wanting to explain his uh, position that he wasn't there and that he was innocent of these charges. He doesn't leave, like leave the state and run. Uh, he basically goes back home. And he sends letters, even to Hanging Judge Parker, uh, saying that uh, I did not commit this crime. Please give me some time to prove my innocence. Marshals would come, bounty hunters, and he realized then that this was a fight that wasn't going to be anything simple for him or his family. He had a, a lot of people protecting him. There was a, a mountain that had been a fort, I guess that you would say, a lookout 
and they would warn Ned when there were marshals or other people in the vicinity of, of his home. I think the sense of community was extremely tight. That extended to everybody that lived here. And so they rallied around him to make sure that he was okay. It's a huge sort of fortified structure. It was designed so that he could look outside the window and see if anybody's coming so he could shoot and could keep himself protected. Family lived there and as many times as the marshals tried to go and get him, he kept himself free from them. Five years. They knew where he was. Five years and they couldn't go and get him. There was a new marshal that came over at Fort Smith and his name was Marshal Jacob Yose. And Yose thought this had gone on long enough so he wanted Ned apprehended and the reward was, was fairly large. I believe it was almost a thousand dollars at that point. They say it was about a posse of about 32 men that came. They'll also bring a cannon with them uh, which shoots projectiles shaped like bullets. From what I understand about 36 shots they sent this cannon shooting at this house and they couldn't bring it down and so much so that the more powder they put in there eventually they end up blowing up part of the cannon. But they also bring with them a lot of dynamite that they used almost like a trailer to take the cannon, take the cannon off of it and the axle, hid behind it and pushed it towards the house because they had TNT, they had dynamite. And while Ned was trying to keep them off and shooting at them, they tossed the dynamite there and brought the structure down. Ned, knowing he's ran out of ammunition, goes out the front door of the cabin and he has his rifle up as if he's going to shoot, but it's empty of any bullets. And of course they shoot him. And then they all unloaded and they killed him. Yeah, he was innocent Cherokee man. They put him on display, public display. Propped him up on the front porch of the, the courthouse and let all of the crowd see him. So people could come up there and they would stand there, take their shots with him, they'd kill Ned Christie. This is the federal government saying this is what happens to you if you decide to go up against us. It's sad to see that as someone's legacy when in the Cherokee Nation, we revere him as this wonderful patriot, somebody who really stood up for our rights as a nation. And Ned was accused of everything, everything, every crime that showed up in those five years that he was running from the people. He was accused of everything, about 11, 12, 15 murders from what I understand. And uh, he didn't do any of them, not a single one. And so around 1918, a man, Humphreys, came forward. He was a, a Cherokee freedman. He states that uh, he saw the murder of Deputy U.S. Marshal Dan Maples, and that it had been Bub Trainer who had, done, who had done the shooting. I really don't think Ned was uh, fully exonerated. And why do I say that? People even call, still today call him an outlaw. But there was no one there to see, so they just killed Ned Christie. If I had three words to describe Ned Christie, a patriotic Cherokee warrior. Our Geronimo, our sitting bull. I believe he set out to prove to his people that you don't have to sit down. You don't have to be in the background. We're still fighting for our sovereignty and our rights today. And so Ned Christie was a voice and a symbol for us then and now. He was fighting for his people. And that's us, the Cherokee people. Which I think is why his legacy, his story still lives on. The Great American Foot Race of 1928 was the biggest sporting event of its time, with hundreds of competitors racing from one coast to the other. And it was a Cherokee Nation citizen named Andy Payne who crossed the finish line first. It was the biggest sporting event of its time. A 1928 cross-country race with its halfway point in Claremore, Oklahoma. Schools and businesses shut down and Oklahomans came out in droves to watch the runners race down Route 66. In the lead was a 20-year-old Cherokee farm boy from Foyle, Oklahoma, Andy Payne. He was an underdog, competing against marathoners, record holders, and professional runners from all over the world. He had just won a cross-country race and a $25,000 prize that came with it. Andy, a Cherokee Nation citizen, had been in California looking for work when he saw a newspaper advertisement announcing C.C. Pyle's first annual transcontinental foot race. Growing up, running the back roads of northeastern Oklahoma, Andy was known to outrun horses and figured if anyone could run from coast to coast, he could. 
The race was meant to promote the newly established Route 66, which had been cobbled together out of dirt roads and paved highways. The Route 66 Association hoped to encourage Americans to take long-distance road trips on the new Main Street of America, and so enlisted C.C. Pyle to create a grand promotional event. The route of the Bunyan Derby, as the newspapers had dubbed it, stretched from Los Angeles Ascot Park to the windy city of Chicago. The runners would continue on to New York City via several different highways and end the race in New York City's Madison Square Garden. The 275 participants came from all over the world and were of many different races, breaking typical segregation laws of the time. Among the runners were record holders and famous marathoners. So little attention was paid to the Oklahoma farm boy, Eddie the Sheik Gardener, the son of two former Alabama slaves, Johnny Salo, a shipbuilder from New Jersey, and an Englishman, Peter Gavuzzi, all had a good chance of winning. The Bunyan Derby began on March 4, 1928, to great fanfare. Each night, the runners would stop in a different town, and their times for the day were recorded. C.C. Pyle, the race's organizer, was a leading sports promoter and the first American sports agent, nicknamed Cash and Carrie Pyle. Always an opportunist, Pyle attempted to get towns along the route to pay for the runners to stop there. Andy and the other runners slept in tents that were transported along the route. Also in the caravan were 40 newspaper reporters, Pyle's custom-made touring bus, and a carnival that Pyle set up nightly in each town, complete with freak show attractions, and the mummified body of Oklahoma outlaw Elmore McCurdy, who had been dead for 17 years. The runners encountered plenty of obstacles, including running on unpaved roads, accidental injuries by motorists, subpar meals and sleeping conditions, and changing weather. After a particularly grueling hot day of running, nearly 60 miles through the Mojave Desert on day eight, only 130 racers remained. The burning heat of California was soon followed by 7,000 feet of elevation at the highest point of Route 66 near Flagstaff, leaving only 100 runners. Andy Payne took second place in Arizona, and it was here that the newspapers began paying attention to this Cherokee kid. On the 12th day, Andy came in first to the checkpoint in Seligman, Arizona, but the lead didn't last long. A sore throat turned out to be tonsillitis, and Andy lagged behind over the next few days. He forced himself to continue running while he recovered with the help of his trainer, Tom Young. Andy had employed Young with a promise of payment of 10% of any of the prize money he should win. Frigid cold, snow, and ankle-deep mud met the runners in the Texas Panhandle. But on Easter Sunday, April 8th, Andy, in front, led the rest of the participants into his home state of Oklahoma. Some Oklahomans had banded together to offer a $1,000 reward to the first runner to enter the state, and Andy thrilled everyone when he crossed the state line in the lead. Because of Andy's popularity, Pyle had a special Andy Payne edition of the official race program published. Over the 12 days the race remained in the Sooner State, Oklahomans celebrated their newest favorite son. In Oklahoma City, a line of a thousand cars followed Andy into the city. A massive crowd showed up for a parade in Andy's honor. In Tulsa, busloads of bands from all over the state greeted Andy and his fellow runners. He had been stopped and greeted so many times, he briefly lost his lead and had to be escorted by a police motorcade through Tulsa. When Andy reached Clamore, the largest town near his hometown of Foyle, he received a 22-gun salute from the cadets of the Oklahoma Military Academy and was greeted by Will Rogers on the halfway mark of the race, 1,650 miles in. Andy had a chance to visit briefly with his family and his sweetheart, Vivian, at home in foil before leaving the state to continue the derby. Andy maintained his lead on and off for the rest of the race with Englishman Peter Gavuzzi and Johnny Salo from New Jersey, his closest competition. Other runners dropped out due to injury, fatigue, or cheating. Andy again had to have a police escort when the route entered Salo's hometown of Passaic, New Jersey, as there was a rumor that Salo's friends were going to run Andy over. In reality, Johnny Salo and Andy Payne became friends. And after the race, Salo said of Andy, I'm just proud to have been able to run with such a man. On May 26, 1928, after 3,422.3 miles, running 573 hours, 4 minutes, and 34 seconds, over 84 days, in which he averaged 
40 miles per day, 10 minutes per mile, and wore out five pairs of shoes, Andy Payne came in first place in the transcontinental foot race, beating his nearest competitor by 15 and a half hours. Only 55 of the original Bunyan Derby runners made it to the finish line in New York City's Madison Square Garden. Andy Payne used a $25,000 prize to return to Oklahoma, pay off the mortgage on his parents' farm, buy a car to travel to visit Vivian, and marry her the next year. After accomplishing such an extraordinary feat, Andy Payne retired from running. He went on to serve as the clerk to the Supreme Court of Oklahoma and died in 1977 at the age of 70. As a young girl, Mary Golda Ross fell in love with math and science. Later in life, she became an unsung hero, a Cherokee engineer and mathematician who helped put a man on the moon. Mary Golda Ross is known as the Cherokee rocket scientist, an aerospace engineer, and the first Native American female engineer who helped put a man on the moon. Ross was born in Park Hill, Oklahoma on July 9, 1908, and grew up in Tahlequah, the Cherokee Nation's capital. She was the great-granddaughter of renowned Cherokee chief John Ross, and at a young age developed a special interest in math and science. She graduated from Northeastern State Teachers College, now Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, and taught math and science in public schools. Ross herself returned to school to study astronomy, and in 1942 was hired by Lockheed Aircraft Corporation in California. Her work as a mathematician there helped create engineering designs for fighter jets, missile systems, satellites, and rockets, and helped launch the famous space race. In the 1960s, Ross became part of a top secret team of engineers at Lockheed who created theories for space travel. She was one of the authors of a NASA planetary flight handbook about space travel to Mars and Venus. After retiring from Lockheed in 1973, Ross became a staunch advocate for engineering and math opportunities for Native Americans and women. In her final years, she became a strong supporter of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., and attended its grand opening at age 96. Mary Golda Ross passed away in 2008, just three months shy of her 100th birthday. Dr. Isabel Cobb was the first female doctor in Indian Territory. Hoping to help women and children, she broke new ground for women in medicine. At the close of the 19th century, women held only 5% of medical degrees. Isabel Cobb was one of these pioneering doctors. She was the first female physician in Indian Territory and a Cherokee Nation citizen. Born in 1858, Isabel was the oldest of six children. She recalled how witnessing one of her siblings' births influenced her decision to pursue a career in medicine. The post doctor had to be called from Fort Gibson several days after the birth of my mother's baby because no doctor was in attendance. So you see, doctors were needed and that was the main reason for studying medicine. Isabel attended the Cherokee Female Seminary and taught at the seminary for a few years until it burned in 1887. In 1888, at the age of 30, she enrolled at the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. Following graduation in 1892, she completed an internship at the Staten Island Nursery and Child's Hospital and in 1893 returned to Wagner County in the Cherokee Nation to practice medicine. Isabel Cobb was a frontier doctor who visited patients in their homes and did not always collect payment for her services. Specializing in care for women and children, Dr. Bell, as she was called, continued to practice until 1930 and died in 1947. Her legacy lives on today at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. It's the site of the former Cherokee Female Seminary and Isabel's alma mater. The Isabel Cobb Residence Hall opened here in the fall of 2016. Let's talk Cherokee. The Cherokee syllabary is the writing system invented by Sequoia. Each character represents a syllable in the Cherokee language. In this syllabary chart, the top row contains the six vowel sounds. The subsequent rows include the consonant sounds. Wa. Wa. Frog. Walosi. Walosi. We. We. 
Cat. Where sa? Where sa? We. We. Mushroom. We see. We see. Whoa. Whoa. Eagle. Whoa, Hartley. Whoa, Hartley. Woo. Woo. West. Woo, daily, ga. Woo, daily, ga. Woo. Woo. South. Woo, no wa. Woo, no wa. Knock on the door. Studi, wonka. Studi, wonka. He's known as the Patton of the Pacific. Admiral Joseph Jocko Clark is the most highly decorated Cherokee Nation citizen to serve in the U.S. military. His influence on naval aviation is still felt today. Joseph James Jocko Clark was an admiral in the U.S. Navy, and he had a storybook career, honestly. He is the epitome of the U.S. sailor, the epitome of the Cherokee warrior. And being who he was, um, just his leadership and his determination, that got him the title Patton of the Pacific. Uh, he influenced a whole cadre of naval aviators and naval officers, and, and that effect is still felt today. Admiral Clark was born in Chelsea, Indian Territory. Just like most Cherokees at the time, they're just standard farming family. Well, he was born in 1893. He was the, uh, the oldest of uh, 10 children. Being the oldest, uh, he was put into a, a leadership position uh, quite young. But that ability uh, to lead gave him an edge. He would later on go to uh, the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis and be the first indigenous uh, person to actually graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy. Well, during War I, Admiral Clark served on the USS North Carolina, which was one of those airborne ships at the time. It's at that point in time in, in the Atlantic and, and seeing these, uh, these seaborne planes being catapulted off these ships that he, he really took the turn and wanted to go to naval aviation. He, he had this fascination with it. And um, you've got to admire a guy who will get into a field that just started and it's not fully vetted and uh, be willing to have the intestinal fortitude to, to sit in that cockpit and, and fly a plane that might end up crashing on you. And so he uh, was able to secure a position uh, in flight school uh, in 1924, and by 1925 he, was, he became a naval aviator. Now in the 30s, he was the only aviator on the uh, inspection and survey board, which would test out new aircraft and new ships. Uh, he was able to essentially tweak the design of aircraft and ships. And a lot of the, uh, the items that he instituted, not only on his vessels, but, um, but also in, in his theories as well, were actually implemented as a whole in the U.S. Navy. Will Rogers uh, was invited uh, on board the USS Pennsylvania, and uh, Jocko was assigned uh, to take him up in an aircraft and essentially catapult him off the Pennsylvania. I, I can only imagine the pressure that Jocko was under to ensure that they would both come back safely from this little pony show. You know, Admiral Clark relates that, you know, he and Will Rogers had, you know, spoke over the years because they were, they were great friends. When World War II first broke out, he became captain of his first ship, the Suwannee, and afterwards he was uh, repositioned to the Pacific Theater. It was really at this time that the thought of the aircraft carrier and all the theories that they had really hit home. That if we're gonna take the fight to them, we need these mobile platforms to be able to launch bombing raids. They really stopped the Japanese in their place and then Jocko would become the captain of the USS Yorktown, the fightingest lady of the US Navy. He took the Yorktown out and he spearheaded the occupation of the Central and the Western Pacific Islands. His main fixation was the Bonins, Chichi Jima, Iwo Jima, and Haha Jima. Without those uh, strategic uh, supply depots, um, it couldn't have been done. He attacked that area more than any other area in the Pacific Theater, so much so that they, they actually called it the Jocko Jima Development Corporation. 
and his his pilots actually made these little certificates that was worth one share in the Jocko Jima Development Corporation. And every every pilot who made a bombing run on on the Bonins was was given one. He was aggressive, and he was a demanding leader. He was extremely intimidating. We'll never be ready for combat unless you flight deck crews learn right now to work as a team. Don't you men realize that before long we'll be in dangerous waters? Get it over to starboard! Way over to starboard! He ran a tight ship. You know, he expected the best out of his sailors, but he was always quick to praise. The thing that he did to mitigate the negative effects that could come from being a very strong personality on the bridge was that he took care of his people. He had pilots who said, you know, we, we'd follow you into hell. I mean, they trusted him. I mean, he was the quintessential captain. The military uh, commanders that came out of the greatest generation certainly were of a different breed than our military commanders today. I don't think they reached the same level of celebrity as Jocko or Patton did. The press was all over promoting uh, their successes uh, in both Europe and the Pacific. He later on would uh, move over and be on the USS Hornet as well when he became an admiral and um, was in charge of his own task force. And his men over there loved him just the same. And then the North Koreans invaded the South. And he went over and uh, was uh, put in charge of the Seventh Fleet during the Korean War. He partnered with the Army in providing carrier-based close air support of ground troops in Korea. And he was able to change how the Army and the Navy worked together. He began doing bombing runs from the aircraft carriers behind the bombing line and was, was hitting the supply trucks and supply lines and, and the base camps uh, for the North Koreans and Red Chinese. These runs actually affectionately became known as the, the Cherokee Strikes. And, and that's where the Air Force saw the value of, of naval aviation. Being able to attack the enemy in advance of moving ground troops, that was definitely key to getting us to a position where uh, there would be the ceasefire of 53. He would end up retiring after the Korean War. He was able to retire as a full four-star admiral. The highest distinction he was given was the, the Navy Cross. And a lot of the strategy and, and, and theories that he implemented during you know, World War II and, and the Korean War, a lot of those became the standard. Well, there's only two Cherokee Naval Aviators that I'm aware of. That's myself and Jocko. There's a bond there. You know, he had such an impact, not only on the Navy, but also on our people. It makes you proud to be Cherokee. We hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye because we know we'll see you again. We say, Dota Dago Ha'i. Wado. In the Cherokee Nation, news happens every day. Cherokee Nation's economic impact on the state of Oklahoma now exceeds $2 billion. With this shipment, the tribe has more than doubled its herd in less than a year. That's gonna provide more jobs. To get your Cherokee Nation news, visit onadiscoe.com.